Guten Tag, everybody from Germany. Today, I'm going to show you five stupid mistakes that you could easily avoid when baking sourdough bread. Now, this is a live stream, and those are the five topics that we're going to cover. I'm going to be adding chapters to the video itself. So if you have a question, you can just write it right now in the live stream for each of the chapters. We'll be talking about them. And since it might be a little bit lengthy, I'm adding chapters later so that you can, when you rewatch this video, just skip to the parts that interest you the most. So we're gonna be covering, talking a little bit about your sourdough starter, how to fix it, um, choosing the right amount of flour, sorry, the right amount of water for your flour, um, choosing the right flour that you should use for making a bread. We'll be looking at fermentation, a very complicated topic, but I'll show you a few easy fixes and uh, how you can fix your oven for $15 or 12 euro and 85 uh, cents. And then lastly, there are gonna be some exciting channel updates, which you don't wanna miss. So super excited on this live stream and yeah. Hello everybody. Uh, nice to see people from all around the world uh, dialing in here. There are also some dialing credentials, which I put in the description of the video. And in case you wanna dial in, all you gotta do is, I'm gonna put this here on screen too, Follow us, join our Discord server, then post a picture of the dough that you want to talk about, of the bread that you want to talk about. And then in there, there's also the link to dial in. Awesome. Yes. So, uh, hello, Luet. Hi, Caro. Hi, Dominic. Hi, Jan. Great to see so many like minded people here. Uh, let's have some fun. Hi, Arnold. Nice to meet you. Sweet. Okay, let's get started with the poor sourdough starter. I think when you're making a bread, the most important thing, the basis for everything is your sourdough starter. Now, I see many people, they start making a sourdough starter, and then a few days later, they start to use their sourdough starter. But then sometimes they have a flat bread. Um, or the bread in general, it just doesn't turn out the way they like. And I think the root for this, the root for, for instance, also sticky dough is that your sourdough starter is not in a way how it should be. So fixing your sourdough starter, I think is probably together with the fermentation, the two single most aspects to help you to bake better sourdough bread. Um, so the fixes for this topic, uh, daily feedings. So what you wanna do is think of flour being fuel for your sourdough starter. And you wanna have a balance. You wanna have a balance of yeast, of bacteria. That's what your sourdough starter is about. You wanna have a healthy balance. Now, sometimes if you neglect some of the feedings, for instance, then this balance goes off. And this means that, for instance, you'll have too much of bacterial fermentation, which would make a very sourdough for instance. And sometimes that's too sour. And this means that your bread simply won't be able to be inflated, which the yeast part does. So you always wanna have a healthy balance of the two different microorganisms. And for that, one of the fixes that I recommend you to do is just do a few more daily feedings. So one feeding per day at room temperature, this really helps you to get a good balance. And this helps to establish uh, a good balance of the microorganisms. Sometimes it can take a little bit longer. So if your sourdough starter is just one week old, it might actually take two weeks for your starter to be ready. Uh, hey, Matt. Hey, Anna. Hi, Arnold. I'm also reading the live stream here. I'm just really bad at multitasking and focusing on multiple things at the same time. So excuse me sometimes if I don't see your message um, right away. Uh, let me just cover, finish this topic real quick, and then we can dive in on some of the questions, and I'll, then I'll be answering them. So feel free to write them in the chat already. Okay, can I go to the other screen? Another cool thing that I like to do is, originally what I would always do is when I made a sourdough bread, I would always use around 20% sourdough starter calculated based on the flour. This is the value that most recipes suggest you to do. Uh, 
So let's say you're making an average sourdough bread. And just for simplicity, it might be very large bread. So we're using 1,000 grams of flour. Most recipes would tell you to use around 200 grams of starter, 20% in terms of Baker's math. Now, the problem, what you need to know is the 20% are actually containing many microorganisms and the balance might not be so good. If you're the kind of person that gives you stutter regular, that gives you stutter regular feedings and so on, then 20% might be safe. But if your sourdough over time becomes a little bit more sour, then the yeast part is no longer so active and the bacterial part might be more active. And so when you introduce your sourdough stutter to your main dough, you actually have a balance that's a little bit off. One thing, though, that you also need to know is that, I mean, your, your dough is pretty much like a gigantic sourdough bread, like a gigantic sourdough stutter, I mean, sorry, except the salt. So your stutter is going to regrow inside of your main dough. So rather than using 20% where you have a big chance of messing something up with your stutter, these days I always like to go for a little bit less stutter. So instead of 200 grams, 20%, I would go for 10%, half of that. And this means your stutter is going to regrow with a better balance inside of your main dough. What this means though is that your speed, your speed when your dough is ready, it's a little bit slower. So this is something you have to take into account. But I think by using less, you're always more on the safe side. Hope that made sense. Yes, and I talked about this before, let your starter mature more. So it might even take you a month or so until your starter is having a good balance of all the different components. So just give your starter one daily feeding for a few more days after you think it's ready and that really helps to make you a better starter. Okay, so that was part number one. Let me have a look at some of the questions here. Matt has a question. Matt asks, Hendrik, my big question is, if my enriched loaves do better, should I rest on my laurels and do brioche and croissants? Hmm. One thing that I've recently noticed is I've been experimenting a lot, experimenting a lot with different starters. And I noticed that a stiffer starter really helps to favor the yeast part of your sourdough. So all you do is, change your sourdough starter. Instead of using equal parts of flour and water to feed it, use one part of flour and half of that in terms of water. You'll have a sourdough starter that has a lot more leavening power. You'll make fluffier breads. There's a downside to it, of course. If you're the person that likes the very sour tang, then you lose a little bit of that. But if you have issues with flat dough, for instance, this might be a good option that you could do. And hopefully that's gonna help you with your enriched dose. I think probably it's that there's a little bit of sugar inside and that just means that everything happens faster for you. Hope that made sense, Matt. Um, Harnold, great question here from Harnold. I see many videos, blogs, ETC say, say that the starter is ready to use in seven days. Can we agree that this uh, maybe a little bit too fast. Yes, I totally agree, Arnold. I've seen people where it took 20 days for the sourdough starter to be ready. Um, and actually, in fact, it's better to use a sourdough starter that's a little bit more mature because at the start, there might be some microtoxins inside of your starter. Over time, when you feed it more, you deplete more of those microtoxins. So uh, I think it's better to mature it for a little bit longer. Sandy. Great question. Hendrik, should I feed it on the rise as it deflates or just at a 24 hour mark? So if you are doing the strategy of feeding your sourdough stutter once per day, then um, I would just feed it on the 24 hour mark and use just a really tiny bit of your sourdough stutter, let's say five grams, and feed that with 10 times the amount of flour and then 10 times the amount of water. So that's a one to 10 to 10 ratio. This just allows the microorganisms to, they pretty much have a green, a green slate that they can start regrowing inside of that starter. So this high feeding ratio really helps you to get that balance that you want. And 
even if your sourdough starter started to deflate a little bit, that's actually a sign that the gluten network starts to break down inside of your sourdough starter typically. Then just use less starter because your starter is going to regrow inside of your main dough. So people always go on for, yeah, I'm using it at peak performance. Sure, you can do that, but I really don't think that that's so important. If you're past peak performance, just use a little bit less starter. Your starter is gonna regrow inside of your main dough. Hope that made sense, uh, Sandy. Dubin, great question here. Does storing the starter in the fridge lead to the bacteria becoming dominant? <sighs> I have done a really cool experiment on this recently. Um, I was on vacation and then I forgot my dough inside of the fridge for three weeks. If you haven't seen the video, check out the channel. I think it's a really interesting video. <clears throat> and I always thought that at lower temperatures, mostly the yeast part was active. That's actually how Pilsner beer uh, started to be brewed instead of the city of Pilsner in Czech Republic because they found some caves and there was very cold. Then they had yeast and that would still work at the cold temperatures. And uh, yeah, so I thought, okay, the bacteria is dormant, but then my dough was so incredibly sour after three weeks and it was at around six degrees Celsius. Please don't ask me how much it is Fahrenheit. Please, in, uh, one of the viewers, do the calculation and write it in the chat. Appreciate that. Uh, and yeah, it was incredibly sour in the end, which means that the bacteria is not dormant inside of the fridge. But of course, this might also depend on your sourdough stutter. Every sourdough stutter really is unique. There's some general rules, but then still your stutter is your own stutter and it might, you might have cultivated different yeast, different bacteria. I think that's super cool about sourdough, but also a little bit intimidating because yeah, it's just so complex. And that's why I think it's very hard to give a very simple recipe where it's just now wait two hours, wait six hours, because chances are this is never gonna work for you. You always have to find your own way and I think that's also why I started this channel to just show people that um, you need to read your dough. You need to understand what's happening. Hope that answered your question, Dubin. Great question from Andrew here. Andrew Genender, Gluten Talk. Uh, I hope I pronounced your name uh, correctly, Andrew <laughs> Genender. Uh, the question is, if I use less starter, 10% instead of 20%, this leads to a longer fermentation. Will my bread be more sour because of this? Um, or no change except for the fermentation time? Yes, Andrew, there is no change except for the fermentation time. There are some really, really tiny, small exceptions because the moment your flour gets into contact with water, it sort of starts to... Uh, break down a little bit. Imagine a seed. A seed wants to start to sprout the moment water is in contact with it. And so the seed has to transform a little bit. And those reactions happen the moment your flour is in contact with water. So if your dough is for too long at room temperature, then it might be that your flour starts to break down a little bit. But if your fermentation takes 12 hours, 14 hours or so, I think you're totally on the safe zone. And if it gets too much, 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 much longer, then you might have some issues. Hope that answered the question. Mateus Cabral, really like your videos, congrats. First pizza I made was from your video. Thank you so much, Mateus, uh, pretty appreciate it. Okay, then I'm gonna be proceeding with point number two, where I think many people screw up the wrong amount of water for your flour. And this really is, I think, one of the biggest learnings that you as a hobby baker have to make. You wanna start making something, you find that nice ciabatta recipe, nice baguette recipe, and you just mix everything together, and then you're wondering, what? My dough is just so sticky, I can't do anything with it. And you likely have exactly experienced what I'm going to describe right now. You use the wrong amount of water for your flour. The amount of water that you should use for your flour totally depends on your flour. So if you see a recipe where it just says, 
use all-purpose flour and use 200 grams of water. Please close the website. Whatever is written there is not going to work. If the recipe would say, please use 200 grams of water for this specific brand of flour, then that's something that you could work with. But other than that, you have to figure this amount out for your own flour. Very, very important. I always recommend to go in general a little bit on the lower side of water. But if you want to have that chewy, nice, soft, moist crumb, then you have to go a little bit higher in water. But don't worry, I got a cool trick prepared that I want to show you how you really know exactly how much uh, water you should be using. And um, the next thing that happens is, this is actually a dough that I made a few years ago. Your dough is just, it's too extensible. It's gonna float out like a pancake and it's super, super sticky. And this means that your dough won't be able to hold its structure. And then when you're baking, your dough simply won't spring upwards inside of the oven. It will tend to be more of a pancake. And this is exactly the same reason you have used too much water for your flour. On top of that, I think this dough, I didn't ferment long enough. It's been quite some time ago, but yeah, just wanted to show you, um, happened to me a lot too in the past. How do we fix this? We do a so-called hydration test. What I like to do is in advance, when I bake with a new flour, I just take 100 grams of the flour and then I prepare different bowls. And then I just add different amounts of water to all the bowls. Then I just mix that. I let that sit for an hour. And then I test. Over time, the glue network should automatically form. Test that. Test if you can get some sort of a window pane effect. And if you can, then that's safe. If you can't, that's too much water for your flour. And I, I know this sounds cumbersome. But this means that you will always make the perfect dough with the right amount of water. And if you're very, very experienced, you can, of course, play with this and go even a little bit higher. What you can also do is you can just knead more. If you have a stand mixer, you will be surprised. If you knead your dough for long enough, at some point it's going to come together. But it can take some time. Actually, I've made those which had a lot and a lot of water and then I was kneading for 20 minutes and at the start after five minutes I thought this is never going to come together. Then I just wait for 10 minutes. This helps also the flour to absorb a lot of the water so be smart about it. Don't knead fully at the start. Do a few intervals. This just helps the flour to soak up all the water and uh, yeah then I knead it again and the dough came together really 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 nicely. I think that's a cool trick. Yes, and uh, using the wrong flour, make sure that you use the correct flour. Ah, right, that was point number three already. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm gonna go back one more time and check the questions. So <laughs> let me see what I'm seeing here. Matt has a great question here. Matt, does a beer bread require less starter because of the yeast in the brew? Um, it depends. Typically, for many beers, they are filtered and then the yeast is dead. Um, it would surely also take a little bit of time because the yeast might likely be dormant in case it's unfiltered. There has been no food and the yeast would just need to have a little bit of time to regrow. And actually, the other yeast, the dry yeast, is probably going to take over the whole dough. They're not so open-minded. They like to take the whole dough for themselves. That's also why once you have a matured sourdough starter, it's very hard for your sourdough starter to catch mold. So it might be, it might not be. Hope that makes some sense. Felipe Sancho, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so I said before, six degrees Celsius, I noticed that my dough still kept on fermenting. That's 42 degrees Fahrenheit. The magic number in the universe, 42. That's so awesome. <laughs> now, another question from Lynx Loco. 
love your videos. Thank you. I've tried to make sourdough multiple times now, but the first couple of times it was so insanely sticky. Turns out that me using rye makes it super sticky. Do you know why? Yes, actually, that's point number three that we will be talking uh, about in just a little bit, specifically also rye flour. Wolf of Anabolica. <laughs> Wolf on steroids, great username, a good one. Does the type of flour I use in my starter affect my final dough? Uh, I bake wheat breads, but my starter is a rice starter. Yes, it does affect your main dough. So if you have a sourdough starter, which contains a lot of rye, rye is really not so good when it comes to developing a gluten network. Then of course, the properties from that rye flour will be mixed with your main dough. So it might be that your dough actually becomes a little bit more sticky. But then on the other side, you're introducing some rye flour to a wheat-based dough, which I think is a really, really great way to improve the taste of your bread. So. Yes and no. You have to be a little bit careful, but I think it's a great way to also improve the flavor of your dough. Klaus Schmidt, greetings from the Bread Paradise, Germany. Hi, Klaus. Where are you from? Which city? Um, I'm from Hamburg, by the way. We Hamburgians are saying this is the most beautiful city, but unfortunately, we really have the worst uh, weather here. It's like always raining. <laughs> um, Caro, does your dose bring more if you scream at it? Yes, Caro, I think this really helps. Uh, please do record a video of this and send this over. I'm going to share it with the audience. We, uh, I think this would be super interesting to see. <laughs> Matt, another question, Matt, you are on fire. Do Frisbees still taste good? Yes, they definitely do taste good. They're quite sour, so I like pairing them with something sweet, but still, Every bread that you're making at home, even if it's just a frisbee, it's still going to taste really, really, really awesome. So, Ciso here. Uh, please also do share your Instagram, Ciso, because I want to share. He has actually started to open up his own bakery in Brazil, and he's making amazing bread. Let me just show you his username here in a little bit. Um, please do check that out. Thank you so much. Truly appreciate it. Obrigado. Um, Dominic, Baker's Math was a real game changer. Thank you for introducing me and the whole community to this method. My pleasure. I think Baker's Math, if you've not heard about it, don't be scared about it. It's a very simple way. So you have 1,000 grams of flour, and then all the other ingredients are calculated based on that. Bakeries are doing this because then they can just scale up or down the quantities of what they're doing. And I think this is a really good way. And I wish just other recipes would include this. Maybe when you're making a tomato sauce, just place all the, base all the ingredients in a percentage based on how many tomatoes you have or so. I think this makes things a lot easier sometimes. Um, Louise, hi. Moin, Louise. I have a Tamador steam oven. Any advice on settings as I'm not getting an ear? Uh, nice, Louise. I wish I had a steam oven too myself. So I think a steam oven makes a few things a lot easier because normally you want to create steam because the steam prevents a crust from being formed. And this means your dough is going to grow more inside of the oven. But sometimes, for instance, if the temperature is too high, or if your dough has too little dough strength, or if your dough is too sour, then it just won't pop upwards in the oven. I'm going to talk a little bit more on this topic, Louisa, in a little bit at the end of the stream. Um, so please stay tuned. Or if you're not watching, please check back later. Uh, I'm going to have a few cool tricks for you prepared that are going to work. So Klaus Schmidt, greetings from Nuremberg. Nice. If you have not been to Germany, I think Nuremberg is one of the most beautiful places to visit. Really lovely city. Love it over there. Uh, Horst Horstensen. Do you think it's even possible to make it good though with only rye type 997? Or would you always add some wheat for gluten? My rye dough always too sticky. Maybe I need to use less water. Horst, we are going to talk about that in just a few minutes, and I think that's going to answer your uh, question. 
So, Summer Deep actually joining in from Twitch. Oh my goodness. So I'm streaming this live on YouTube and Twitch and a person from Twitch actually just joined. This is really, really cool. <laughs> the question is, is buckwheat a viable flour to use in your starter? Buckwheat doesn't have any gluten, but still you can make a really, really nice starter out of it. Yes, that works. I also made one out of corn flour before. You can make a gluten-free starter. That definitely works. Um, Okay, I'm gonna be jumping on point number three and then we can continue on the questions. If you wanna dial in, please check the description. There's a link to the Discord server and inside of Discord, I actually um, shared everything inside of the submissions channel. Let me just verify one more time that I actually did that. Yes, I shared that. So in case you wanna talk, uh, ask a question, that's a great way uh, how you can join the live stream. Okay, dokes. Now, go back to the other window. Let's talk about point number three, which I think is also really important. You are using the wrong flower. Cl disclaimer, there is actually no wrong flower. There's only wrong flower for what you are trying to achieve. And I think that's a very important learning that you need to make. So what do you want to bake? What is your goal? Do you want to have a fluffy, like really super soft, fluffy bread? Or do you want to have a hearty, more dense bread? Depending on that, you want to choose the flour. <clears throat> so if you want to make a fluffy bread, then wheat is the option that you want to go for. And that's because wheat has so much gluten. Same actually for modern spelt. So wheat and modern spelt are on the one side and then rye flour and all the others are on the other side. They have very little gluten. Or for rye, it's very hard for a gluten network to form. And that's why they will always be a little bit dense. So I think it would actually be a good video to show making one wheat bread and then one rye bread next to each other to visualize the differences. But for wheat, it's so much harder. You have to do some stretch and folds, dough strength is important, all this. But for the other category, including rye and emmer, old spelt, and so on, you don't have to do anything of this. You just mix together your ingredients, you let that ferment, then you place that in a banner tin, let it proof for a bit and bake it. I think making a rye bread is so much simpler than making a wheat bread. So if you want to make a rye bread with an open crumb, that's simply not possible. So you have been using the wrong flour for what you're trying to achieve. I hope that makes sense. And then you also need to know, what do I want? What's just talking about the wheat category now, what sort of wheat bread do I want to make? There's bread flour and there's all purpose flour. If you're from Germany, all purpose flour is actually type 550 in Germany. And bread flour is also type 550 in Germany. Uh, there's just one, one, one major difference in bread flour and all purpose flour. And bread flour is a strong flour. And that means that's a flour which has a lot of protein and 80% of that is gluten. So if you check on the left-hand side, you can see proteins minimum 15.5, gluten 13.5 on this flour that I like to use from Molino Padano. Then here on the right-hand side, the other flour has around 10% protein. So the flour on the left is much, 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 much stronger. This means it can absorb a lot more water. Plus, when you're baking with sourdough, you have this jar consisting of billions of microorganisms. The lactic acid bacteria that you have inside of your sourdough, <clears throat> they are eating the gluten network that you have. So over time, the longer you let your dough sit, the less gluten you actually have inside of your main dough. And this is, I think, really cool because this means that if you have issues with digesting gluten over time, your dough is gonna be easier and easier for you to digest. That's actually why some people who have issues can eat sourdough bread. But over time, 
there is no more gluten left. And what's going to happen? Your dough is going to become very, very, very sticky. And that's because all the gluten that you have has been digested by the lactic acid bacteria. I'm just checking if I have an example picture. Um, Nope, can't. Ah, right here. Too sticky. Let me show you. And so that was a dough I made. And you saw I was trying to lift the flour, but it would just totally stick to my hands. And that's because our dough fermented for too long. And this is important to know because the bread flour, it's excellent. It can ferment for a longer period of time because there's more gluten initially that can be broken down. If you want to use an all-purpose flour, then you can't ferment your dough as long. So the fermentation is shorter. But if you want to have that really, really sour flavor in your bread, if you want that tang, which many people love, including me, I think it's really, really great, then the bread flour is better for you because you can ferment for a longer period of time because there's more gluten that can be broken down. For all-purpose flour, in my last videos, I was testing a lot with a stiffer stutter where you have more focus on the yeast part. Then you can also be using an all-purpose flour for your stiff stutter. But if you want that very sour taste, you need to get yourself a strong flour. I hope that made sense. Yes, so the fix is, I talked about it before, you need to know your goal, what you actually want to achieve. So do you want to make a rye bread or a fluffy bread? Now, if you want to make a fluffy bread, then rye, you can add a bit of rye, but that's not gonna work. Rye and fluffy, they just, they just don't work together. You want a tang? You want a sour tang? Then go for a bread flour. Very important. The more gluten you have, the more can be broken down, the longer you can ferment. The longer you ferment, the more flavor you also have inside of your dough. If you want a mild flavor, then go for all-purpose flour. And then you might want to look at using a stiffer stutter. One thing you could also do is, in case you just have an all-purpose flour and you want to tweak that, you can add some vital wheat gluten to it. And for the vital wheat gluten, I recommend you to add around five grams of vital wheat gluten to your all-purpose flour. Then you're at around 15% protein overall, probably. So that's a good way for you to tune up your flour that you have. You can just buy vital wheat gluten online somewhere or in your probably special shop nearby somewhere and just mix that in your flour. Make sure to really nicely mix it in because else if you add water too early, you're gonna have like some, some strands of gluten that are very hard to dissolve afterwards in your main dough. So this could be a good way for you to fix. Use around five grams per 100, gram of, 100 grams of flour. Hope that makes sense. I'm just going back to the chat now and uh, let's see what the others are writing. Um, ta -da. So, the expert, hello Hendrik, what in your opinion is the single most important factor contributing to open crop? I have my own opinion and believe it to be the strength of the starter, full stop. Nope, I don't think that that's the, that's actually a very good question, so I appreciate you ans answering that. And I think we could probably grab a beer and then talk for this on this topic for hours, I think. Um, but to me, you want to have the right flour and you want to have a sourdough starter that's very, very active, that favors the yeast part, the yeast part that's responsible for inflating your dough. And that's why some bakers go crazy on daily feedings because they really want to boost that yeast option. But try using a stiffer starter. A stiffer starter really helps to boost that yeast part portion like a lot. And then you need to know which flour you want to use. Don't go for a too strong flour, because if you have a very, very dense gluten network, it's like a thick car tire. Go for a flour that's not so high in protein. So that flour, it's more extensible. It can be inflated a lot easier. 
That in comparison with the stiff stutter is going to help you a lot. And look at the fermentation times. I mentioned before that your flour starts to break down the moment your flour gets into contact with water. This is what bakers, they have a fancy word for it, autolysis. I never know how to pronounce it, so please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, this starts to break down the starch into sugars for the yeast, sorry, for the germ, but then the yeast eats this. And then also this starts to break down the gluten network that softens your gluten network. So your dough is gonna be much more extensible at some point and can be inflated more. That's why I think an autolysis can help you with that open crumb. Or you just use less butter, have a slower fermentation, you do sort of a fermento lease. I'm sorry for throwing so many words around. Uh, please drop a message in case that didn't make any sense. <clears throat> Dubin, any thoughts on starting the bake in a cold oven? Yes, you can do that. If you have a very stiff dough, you can totally do that. There is no problem at all. If you have a dough that's quite high in hydration and that you just bounced out of your banneton inside, then it's going to take a little bit, a little while. Your dough is going to get more extensible and you have a flat pancake in the end. Plus, you would need to use parchment paper because else the dough would start to stick, for instance, to your Dutch oven or so. Generally, 95% of the time, you want to preheat your oven. Uh, I made a few experiments on this. Uh, feel free to check them out. Uh, there are some more interesting findings in those experiments. Hope that helped. So, Jan46, I have a question. Is there a way to calculate the baking time depending on the weight of the dough? Ah, not so easy, Jan, unfortunately, because it could also depend on the volume that your dough has. So when I use a loaf pan, for instance, that just it takes way longer sometimes, especially if the dough has been cold before. So the best way, I would say, to know that your dough is done, use a thermometer to check it. I don't think you can really calculate it. Normally for me, it's always total baking time, time around 45 minutes, but for my large loaf pan, it can sometimes take one and a half hours. And use a thermometer to measure the core temperature. That really helps to know when your bread is done baking. That's around 95 degrees Celsius. Again, I'm sorry if I don't know the Fahrenheit value. Maybe I do know it. Let me check this. Ah, no. Nope. So this was some sort of sheet that I prepared in advance to convert Fahrenheit to Celsius. But unfortunately, nope, I don't have the temperature on it. So 95 degrees Celsius, then you for sure know that your dough is done. Sorry, Americans. I'm very, very sorry. Hope that answered it. Caro, when will you master the art of sourdough dinkelbrot? Caro, you know what? I actually went to the supermarket the other day and I bought me some spelt flour and I have made a spelt bread, but it turned out terrible. Because you know what happens? I had to go somewhere else and then I just couldn't take care of the dough anymore. It turned out really, really, really sticky, unfortunately. But other than that, I was amazed by how the dough, the scent of the spelt, um, all right, I should have probably translated, Dinkelbrot is a spelt bread, and we Germans love spelt flour too. So hopefully soon, someday, I can show you a recipe. And for spelt, I think it's very important. Modern spelt is very similar to wheat in its properties, and then old spelt is more towards the rye MRI corn category. <laughs> Matt has got to run. Yes, please do that again. So if you just joined, um, I'm covering all the questions. I'm answering the questions in between and I'm adding chapters. So when you rewatch, you can just jump ahead to the corresponding chapters. And it's always going to be like this for the other mistakes that we'll be covering. I'll first talk about them. Then we'll be answering a few questions here. So then, yeah, just jump to the chapters that interest you the most, as this video is probably going to be a little bit longer overall. So Steve Werner, Hendrik, I'm using only a rice starter, and it becomes very foamy and bubbly. However, using the bread flour, it becomes more elastic, gluteny. What is the right or the best to use as a starter? Thanks from South Africa. 
Hey, Steve, thank you so much for the great question. I think that's a great question. This depends on what sort of flavor you are looking for. If you're making a sourdough starter, then as far as I can tell, rye flour helps to make it more active faster because rye naturally contains more yeast on the hull of the grain. So a rye flour starter becomes active faster. So that could be a good trick. But then it depends on what do you want in terms of taste. Do you want that rye taste? then use rye. Do you want that more neutral taste? Then go for a wheat-based starter. So choosing the type of starter, I think it's mostly what you prefer in terms of taste. Also, my flour bread, my starter bread pit has been fed with spelt before, rye, emmer, einkorn, even gluten-free flours, and it totally works. So you can just switch one starter from one part to the other, I, I don't think it makes sense to maintain different starters for different flowers. So I just have one starter that depending on what I want to make, I just adjust what I feed my starter with. Hope that makes sense. <clears throat> Eloberto, what if you add vital wheat gluten to the rye flour? Actually, some one of you has made this experiment a few weeks ago and then sent me a picture on Instagram and it didn't work. Please don't ask me about the exact chemical reason why, but there's some kind of uh, amino acid, I think, or some kind of protein that prevents rye from building a gluten network. That's the reason why rye is always so sticky. Uh, if you know more, please write it in the comments. I would totally appreciate that. Triff, isn't type 802 bread flour? So, Nope, it's not bread flour. I don't know who put this myth on the interwebs, but bread flour is the same as all-purpose flour, just with a stronger flour, so more gluten. And 802, it's like more towards the whole wheat direction, but it's not bread flour. In Germany, we don't have the concept of bread flour that much. What you find sometimes is extra backstock, very strong flour. Uh, that's because we here in Germany, we are great for growing rye, but the weather here does not permit to grow wheat so well. So the wheat flour that you find here in Germany is typically not as strong. You need to have sun. The sun enables the wheat to build a lot of gluten. So that's why typically when I like, when I make wheat bread, I shop flour from Italy, for instance, or so, because it's just better flour that you get there. We though here, we make perfect rye flour. I hope that made sense. Um, then here, Ciso, thank you so much. One more time. Uh, please check that out. Paolo Ciso on Instagram. Uh, he really makes amazing bread and yeah, thanks for all the support Ciso. Truly appreciate it. Um, Log OS. Best flour you can get in Europe is 00, zero from Italy. So 00, zero is actually cake flour. So it's not bread flour. 00, zero is a very finely grained flour. So it doesn't contain so many outer parts. However, the flour, because you have a lot of sun in Italy, is able to build more gluten. And that's why the pizza is done with typically cake flour type zero zero but then very 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 strong so i hope that makes sense um, we here in germany and italy we look at how finely it is milled so type zero type zero zero type 450 i think no 405 in germany 550 but the americans look at more of is it all purpose can you use it for everything and then is it strong so does it have a high gluten amount So, hope that made sense. For a thicker starter, what flour do you recommend, Louisa? So when you want to make a thicker starter, so a stiffer starter, just use your regular starter that you already have and just the only thing you change is how much water you feed your sourdough starter. That's the only thing you wanna change. And then use exactly the same flour that you previously used. The flour itself, I would say it's mostly responsible for adding flavor to the main dough. So you can use wheat, you can use rye, it's all going to work. 
and just change the amount of water that you use for your starter. And you will see that after some time, you'll have more yeast activity rather than bacterial activity. Hope that makes sense. Lil Bengt, Glutenabend, Glutenabend back. Uh, Summer Deep, your scientific approach is amazing, by the way. Thank you so much. So I don't think it's a real scientific approach. It's probably pseudo, pseudo scientific, but I'm just trying to be as scientific as possible. But it's really hard with sourdough because there are so many different variables that you have to control. Sometimes I wish I could just, you know, taste or test 100 doughs to really have statistical reliable results. But since this is not my main job, I don't have the time, but that would be so cool if you could do that. You know, just run experiments on a much larger scale to see how statistically significant they are. <laughs> Cyprian Laplace, why is open crumb the gold standard? Thank you so much for the great question. And <clears throat> I think, yes, on Instagram, which is a very visually driven platform, open crumb is what people like the most. I think it's just because it's so hard to achieve it. So if you achieve open crumb, then you have mastered sourdough bread. You have really perfected every single part of the process. It's very hard to make open crumb bread. So it just it's a way of showing off your skills. Um, yeah, you're showing off that you know how, <laughs> how to bake, <laughs> probably. Uh, but is it the best taste? Nope. Sometimes you want to have smaller pockets. Uh, you want to focus on the flavor. Flavor is king. But unfortunately, you can't really share that via Instagram yet. So uh, don't. If you like open crumb, sure, but to me, that's just one part of the equation. Flavor is always what's most important. Hope that makes sense. <laughs> so earlier, Felipe, thank you so much. 95 degrees Celsius, that's 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Lil Bengt, another great question. So what is the best for maximizing the yeast part in the sourdough, stiff or liquid starter? So I've been baking a lot with a liquid starter in the past. Um, there are different starter types. Let me explain by explaining you the first regular starter, the starter almost everybody uses. That's one part of flour, one part of water, 100% hydration. Now I've been making a liquid starter recently where I have one part of flour, five parts of water. So it has a lot more water and there's something that's really really cool that's happening the moment you do that the flour after some time is going to start to sit at the bottom of your sourdough jar and you will have a layer of liquid on top that's why it's called a liquid starter now what happens is that there's not enough oxygen for the bacteria the bacteria has lactic acid bacteria and acetic acid bacteria. Then depending on whether they have oxygen or not, they might be producing acetic acid. So typically you have two products from your sourdough, lactic acid and acetic acid. Lactic acid has dairy notes. Acetic acid has vinegary notes. And to make acetic acid, you need to have oxygen. So by having a liquid starter, you are depriving your starter of oxygen because there is no oxygen that can go through the water near the bottom. And after a while, you will have prioritized the bacteria that's anaerobic, that doesn't need air. And this means that your starter is gonna, in, is gonna put more dairy nodes to your main dough. If you have a regular starter at 100% hydration, you'll have both dairy nodes and vinegary notes. Now with the stiffer starter, you mostly have yeast. So you have um, CO2 for leavening. You'll have some alcoholic notes inside. It's much more mild. But still you have typically lactic and acetic notes inside. And uh, I'm currently testing with my liquid starter. I converted to a stiffer starter. And think about it is, what do you want? What flavor do you want to achieve? More sour? liquid starter direction. Do you want to have a more mild bread than the uh, 
stiff starter. If you want to have a little bit of a vinegary taste, make a regular starter with 100% hydration and use that. So what do you want to achieve? That's pretty much that makes makes or that makes makes me decide what sort of stutter that I'm going for. Sorry for the long answer. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> Code Nasha spelt can't take as much water as wheat. Very interesting. I still need to test more with spelt flour. Horst Horstensen, I love your name. Do you think pizza flour is good for making strong dough? Yes, I'm using pizza flour from most of my sourdough breads. And that works really, really, really nicely. Um, Lynx Loco, what is a good ratio of whole wheat versus normal flour for a good flavor versus good crumb oven spring crust? Whew. It, dep <laughs> it depends on what you want to do, I guess. I like to use around 20% whole wheat in my dough. I think that just adds a little bit of nice flavor. Sometimes if I have guests and I know that they like whole wheat, then I'm making a full whole wheat bread. I think it just has such a nice hearty taste to it. 20% um, whole wheat and you're on the safe side that you still have good properties from the white flour. I hope that helped. So another question here from Summer Deep. The rye taste is great, but wondering now if you could just get the same rye taste by just adding some rye flour to the wheat in the dough instead of just in the starter. Yes, you are right. You could totally do that. Uh, that would work. Alex, Hendrik, have you ever tested if it is better to laminate early or late in the bulk fermentation? Okay, so dough lamination. I think it was a term also coined a lot by Kristen from Foolproof Baking. She's been doing this a lot, and that's the first time that I saw this on YouTube, somebody doing that. She's a really, really, really great baker, and she makes amazing bread. Um, and the way, or the reason for lamination is, if you're kneading by hand, so this is just about kneading by hand. Lamination is, you have a dough, and you make it very, very flat. You lay it over your table in a very flat way. And then your dough has a big surface area. And now what you do is you take the big surface area and you glue the dough together. And this means the dough everywhere sticks together very, 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 very well. And this is an excellent way to knead your dough, to create a lot of dough strength. Now, could you do this also during a later part, at the later part of your fermentation? So when your dough has already set for a few hours. Yes, you could, definitely, and it would help a lot. But then your dough has already been inflated with some CO2, you would be degassing your dough. So the lamination technique, that's only something that you wanna do very, very early at the start of the whole process, not later or else you will be deflating your dough. I hope that makes sense, Alex. If you're talking about stretch and, stretch and, stretch and folds, it's similar to the lamination technique, yes. A stretch and fold is where you just take the dough and you fold it over. And this helps, again, your dough sticks to itself by gluing it together, pretty much. And this is a way to create additional dough strength. Now, if you've been lazy at the start and you didn't need as much, then this could be a good way for you to create more dough strength. Your dough is going to hold together a little bit better and you will have more open spring in the end. Hope that makes sense. Chris Day, Hendrik, hope this hasn't been asked already, but have you ever tried Corazan Weizen 15% Eiweiß? Chris, I've, I've heard about it, but I've actually never baked with Corazan before. I was always a little bit scared because they sort of have a trademark on the, on the name, so I don't know whether there's a lot of marketing involved or not, but I have not tried. Please try yourself and tag me. I would be very interested in seeing the results. Can I exchange the 100 gram of <clears throat> wheat for spelt? Louise is asking. <clears throat> or do I need more or less water? <clears throat> this, so first of all, the first part of the question, yes, you can. If you have modern spelt, it's a crossbreed with wheat typically, then you can just exchange wheat directly for spelt. That works. Now on the water, 
that's something that depends on the flower that you have at hand. You want to be doing that hydration test that I suggested before to figure out what's the right amount of water. Or you just add a little bit, wait, see your dough, how it performs, how it feels, and then add a little bit more water. This is actually what French bakers call the bassinage method, slowly adding more water. It allows your dough to absorb a bit more water. <clears throat> Mary Young, great question. What happens if you use only uh, whole wheat for your stutter? Uh, you will just have a regular stutter. This is something that I've done for years. Initially, your stutter is going to grow faster because you have more contamination with wild yeast on it. Hope that makes sense. <laughs> Hendrik is a show off. I think that was because we were talking about open crumb and uh, why people think it's great to have open crumb. <laughs> uh, yes, so I said before, it's it's very hard to achieve. And I think that's why people like to show off with open crumb. <laughs> hey, Sue Dean, you made it. I'll have to watch later, but I love your channel. Thank you so much. Thanks for all the support, everybody. Uh, I can't believe that so many people are watching me. There's now 110 people watching right now. And I'm wondering, where in the world you are all from please share in the comments i would be super interested in, in seeing it's just crazy how <clears throat> this one thing of baking is uniting so many people from all around the world like people from the us from europe from asia from southern america all share this passion for making amazing bread and then every culture has unique breads to them. And then I see all those pictures and I realize how few things I actually know about baking. And I think this is really cool and I appreciate that a lot. This always gives me a lot of energy. Yeah, seeing people also geek out about bread. Matt, when kneading, does anyone's dough start smooth and then gradually becomes more sticky? I let my dough rest in between kneadings or else it gets too sticky. Yes. I think you're tearing your gluten network a little bit when you're kneading. And so this happens to me too. So the best way to judge whether your dough is actually done kneading is to test the window pane effect. And again, I'm just talking about wheat-based flour. For rye, you just have to mix everything together. That's about it. No kneading required. No kneading required for rye. Just homogenizing everything. Wait five minutes and then test the window pane. I just actually made a dough today with my dad and we had exactly the same situation. We needed, we couldn't get the window pane test, then we waited five minutes and we could get it. So I think this is a very valuable comment here, Matt. Thank you so much. Christopher Vinche, I bake my sourdough bread in a Dutch oven using standard temperature and the time, but the bottom crust often turns out thick and almost burnt. Is there a good way to avoid this? Yes, Christopher. Uh, just use a parchment paper inside of your Dutch oven and you will be surprised how much better this is already is by just adding the parchment paper inside of your Dutch oven. Give this a shot, please, and do let me know if that works. You can put the Dutch oven higher in the oven, Matt is asking, or further from the element. Also, yes, baking stone helps. Yes, so a Dutch oven really helps and you can place it in different areas of your oven. I always like to have it in the middle because then I have equal space from the heating racks, but surely you can experiment a little bit with this. <laughs> um, great, so... T. Erha, can I ask how expensive your flour is per kilo? I think your flour is good handling 90% hydration and I'm wondering what that costs. So I'm sharing the link. So the links to the flour that I've been using are shared in the description from Molino Padano. I think they make excellent flour. And that flour is around two euro per kilo, if I'm not mistaken. If I get organic flour here in Germany, I'm at around one euro 50, which I think is maybe like $2 per kilo. And flour is the most important ingredient. I wouldn't save on it. Because also sometimes what happens is that some of the flour is treated with some kind of fungicides because you don't want any mold to grow on it. And then there are other, also other treatments, for instance, that just dry your flour, uh, dry the seeds before the flour is harvested because you don't want the flour to sprout. That's actually what happens sometimes when it gets very wet, 
the, the new wheat plants start to sprout from the grains. And that's a disaster for wheat because as I explained to you before, the water is converting the storage proteins, the gluten into something else. So you're losing all those good baking properties you would get from the gluten. So I think investing in a good flour is really, really good because then you also can be sure that there are less toxins inside. Does it have to be the flour that I'm using? Definitely not. But just pay attention to it. Check that there are no additives added. That's what I would look at. And wow, then so many people here from all around the world. That's so cool to see. Uh, Wow, we even have Anna Maria from Alaska. Wow, that's like so far. <laughs> Lisa from Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, Chris from Louisiana. Then Peter from Sweden. Angelica from Poland. Colombia, Denmark. <laughs> uh, Bay Area. <laughs> Argentine. Wow. <laughs> That's so amazing to see so many people from all around the world. We should do one gigantic bake out at some point together. That would be so much fun. <laughs> uh, um, TRI, yes. The tips, you can rewatch them at the end. I'm gonna be adding chapters to this video as well because there have been a lot of discussion in between. So what I'm gonna do is when you just joined, I'm gonna be adding chapters so that you can see this is where I answered the question. There is a little bit of discussion. This is where the end where I showed the next tip to fix the mistake and so on. So you can just rewatch this, but in between, I just wanted to make it a little bit more interactive so that you can ask me some questions and we can answer them. I hope that's okay, but I understand, of course, that this is a lot of knowledge and you might want to rewatch it. So I think this is a good way to organize this. I hope that's okay. Um, sweet. Okay, then let's talk about the next topic. Poor fermentation. Now, what is fermentation? Um, fermentation, it sounds like such a complicated word, but it's when mostly microorganisms are converting something into something else. That's done by, for beer, for instance, where you create a little bit of alcohol, for cheese, where raw cow milk sometimes is converted into something else. And I actually just learned today uh, a specialty from Hamburg well, what we like to eat here is Matthias, which is fermented herring. It's actually from the Netherlands originally. But I wasn't so sure because there's actually no bacteria inside, but it's some kind of enzymatic fermentation. Uh, but still, that seems to count as fermentation. When making a sourdough bread or a yeast-based bread, the fermentation is what, what makes your, your flour actually become a bread. You're adding either yeast when you make a yeast-based dough for a sourdough, you're adding your sourdough starter. Now, mastering the fermentation process is the hardest part. And this is the single most important lever that you can, you can pull to make better bread. Mastering the fermentation is probably 95% of everything. And it starts with your sourdough starter, as I explained before. Mastering fermentation is gonna take you from average bread to amazing bread. So this is re really where you want to focus most your energy on. Don't worry so much about stretch and folds, for instance. This is all just micro optimizations. Um, focus on the fermentation. Become better at fermenting. 95% of all the problems. And uh, yes, uh, here you can see actually uh, top left, very, very sticky dough. Then at the bottom, this is actually what I used as a thumbnail for the video. A dough suddenly started to stick to my banneton. It was a big mess. And then here on the bottom right, a picture by Amorosa101 from Discord. Um, poor fermentation, it became too sticky. So when you fix that, you don't have those issues. Actually, going back to the example on the bottom left here with the banneton and the sticky dough, I've always been using rice flour originally in my in my banatons, but I think it's actually a cheat. If you have to use rice flour, this might be a very bold statement, if you have to use rice flour for your dough not to stick, you're doing something wrong. What I like to do these days is, I just rub my dough with a good bit of the same flour that I used for the dough before placing it inside of the banaton. If your fermentation is on point, 
your dough is not going to be so sticky, your dough is not going to stick to the banana. Rice flour helps because it absorbs a lot of water, but then I think if you do everything right on the fermentation, you actually don't need that. So you have one less ingredient that you have to take care of. Of course, rice flour might be good in case you want to make a beautiful pattern or so on the dough. Uh, yeah. And this bread here, <clears throat> this bread is a bread that I made. It was a no need recipe. What does it mean? No need. So most no need recipes that you find out there, people are going to do stretch and folds in between. But a no need bread to me is you mix together all the ingredients once. And that's about it. That's all you do. You don't do any stretch and folds in between. And this bread was made as a no need bread. I have a video on this. And I think no need is great because for no need to work, you need to master the fermentation process. Everything has to be done exactly on point for a no need bread. So I think it's very challenging, um, but I think it's a really cool way to, yeah, to just challenge yourself and see if you actually know how to properly ferment. The fixes. <clears throat> what I like to do is I always like to use a small sample jar. You could be using also a glass. It should be ideally something of cylindrical shape. So it should be something like this, but something more of this cylindrical shape. <clears throat> and what you do is after you mix together all the ingredients, you just take a tiny piece of your main dough <clears throat> and you place it inside. And this is your fermentation meter. Depending on how much this grows in size, you know how much your fermentation has proce uh, processed, progressed, not processed, progressed. And I think using this sample jar is going to help you to nail the fermentation. The size increase in general, I would say that you should look for is around 50%. That mostly always works except when you have a very weak flour. So a very weak flour with very little amounts of gluten then you have to go for a little bit less. You can't ferment as long. But if you have a strong flour, which has a lot of gluten, then you can go even higher. If you're using a stiff starter, I would say you can always, almost always go for a doubling in size. So use the sample jar to your own advantage. And please, don't rely on timings. This is what most people do wrong. Use the sample jar to your own advantage. Um, this will really help you to make uh, better bread by using this uh, sample jar. I think it's a great trick. Uh, taste your dough. Yes, uh, this is me after I tasted a little bit of my dough and suddenly everything became totally crazy. Uh, it's gonna taste a little bit sour, but you will get a feeling for in which stage it is. Taste it at the start, taste it a little bit later. Don't be scared too much. Things like what happened here on this picture might happen to you. So that's something you want to be a little bit careful about. But I I think it's a great way to just learn more about the process. <coughs> Finger poke. Yes, so after you shape your dough, you typically, you have this bulk fermentation, which is you make one large dough for multiple bulks, for multiple breads. Normally, if you're baking at home, you're just making one dough at the same time probably. Still, this is called the bulk fermentation. Once this is done for the sample jar, when it increases in 50 up to 100% in size, you proceed and you shape your dough. You take that large bulk, you divide it into smaller pieces, you shape it, and then you have to prove it again one more time so that it inflates one last time. Because during shaping, you sometimes deflate your dough a little bit. And here, I think the finger poke test really works very, very well. Please, if you're new to baking, try to not use the fridge too much at the start. The finger poke test no longer works when you are making a dough at cold temperatures. Try to use your finger, poke into the dough and see when that dent is still there after a minute, then your dough is done with the proofing stage. This is gonna help you to proof so much better. And then afterwards, you can go to using the fridge. What I actually like to do is I like to proof at room temperature until the finger poke test passes. And then I just freeze my dough for another 30 minutes while the dough, while the, while the oven is preheating. So the finger poke test really helps you to improve the proofing stage of your dough. 
still part of the fermentation. Or uh, you can use a stiff starter. I think actually when I'm gonna be working on a new video for the whole process from start to finish, I'm going to be suggesting people to start off with a stiff starter because it doesn't really matter so much whether you have a weak flower because you don't have so much lactic acid bacteria. So a stiff starter, this is actually a dough that I made and just see how it like bursted out of the banneton. This was so fluffy, this bread that I made with a stiff starter and it really helps to, yeah, just boost the yeast part of your sourdough. So I think if you're new and you're facing flat bread, then this could be a really cool countermeasure, a very, very simple fix you could try. Of course, you're sacrificing a little bit of the tang, but to keep you motivated, this could be a good way. So please, if you have a friend that gave up on Sardo, please uh, share them my channel and tell them, try a stiff stutter, it's gonna make you amazing bread. And then the people will have less of a frustration. And once you master that, you can move on to a more liquidy starter. I think this is a really great thing that I recommend you to try and this is definitely gonna work. Just take your existing starter, instead of feeding it equal parts of flour and water, change it to half the amount of water of your flour. And then you have your stiff starter. Keep feeding it for two or three days so that the yeast can, um, can how do you say this, can uh, accept the new situation and then your stiff starter is ready to be used. And if you don't feel like using your stiff starter, you can always change dehydration back again and uh, go the other way. Okay, sweet. So that's part number four, fermentation. I think really the most important thing that you can work on. I'm gonna be going through the questions one more time. And I see already that somebody dialed in. So if you want to dial in and ask a question, this is what you want to do. You want to go to the Discord server and um, post a picture in Dr. Doe submissions and then follow the link in the channel to dial in. So, <laughs> Gaudi, are you, are you still there? Um, if yes, please unmute your microphone and then I can be adding you to the live stream as well in case you want. Okay. So, one more time, the questions. <clears throat> Ron, hey Ron, how are you? Gluten tag. Have you ever tried using whey leftover from cheese making as the liquid for your sourdough? I have used it lately, I've gotten good results. Would the sourdough then be considered enriched? Ron, I think this is a totally great idea to use the discards that you have and kudos for doing that. Would it be considered enriched? I have no idea, but I think it's a great, a great trick. One thing you need to know though, is that you have a lot of lactic acid bacteria, so the dough might be a little bit more sour in the end. Other than that, I think this is great. Lynx Loco, great question, Lynx, totally appreciate it. What are good properties of whole wheat flour? Also high protein percent. This depends on what kind of bread you want to bake. If you want to make a fluffy whole wheat bread, yes. Uh, get a strong whole wheat flour. Also the one that I'm using, it also has around 15% protein. So it's a very strong flour. It can ferment for a longer period of time. One thing I noticed when making whole wheat, which really changed my whole wheat game was, I would stop making an autolysis, which is just mixing flour and water in advance. And this can be explained because when a seed wants to sprout, the water has to go through the hull. And that's why whole wheat flour has a lot more enzymes. So with whole wheat flour, everything is happening faster. The water is going to start the reactions faster inside of your flour. And so if you ferment for too long, your dough is just gonna get too sticky. So for whole wheat flour, my best breads have been with a shorter fermentation. Uh, because else the flour would just, uh, yeah, it would just deteriorate too much, too fast. Hope that makes sense. Serpent Rider. Great question, gluten talk. How does bran and whole wheat flour affect the gluten structure? 
seriously, I have read so many comments on this before. People saying, yeah, it cuts into the it cuts into the gluten. Some people actually take it out, boil it, and then re-add it, but I think really that's that's cheating. And I have made some really great whole wheat bread without doing any of, you know, pre-boiling some of the uh, the, the flour. I think that's too much pre-boiling parts of the flour. If it cuts into the, if the bran cuts into the gluten, I'm not sure. So my whole wheat bread has never had such a open crumb as my white bread, but still it was super, 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 super fluffy. And still the flavor you get from whole wheat, it's really, really, really cool. Paul Gural. Hey, Belleville, Ontario, Canada. Hey, Paul. Then Rasta Albino, nice name. Uh, hi from Brazil, viel Glück. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, Luisa, sample idea is a game changer. Thank you. I think it's a really good trick. And if you want, you could get yourself a pH meter, get one with a spearhead. I've also linked it in the description, but it's an expensive tool. But if you want to really be very, very serious, then it could be a game changer for you as well. I think it's something you could definitely do. But then it also removes a little bit of the fun because it becomes very, very, very technical, of course, with the pH meter. But it allows you to really monitor the fermentation nicely. So Serpent Rider from Bosnia and Hepsi. Govina, envying on high hydration sourdough because I can only get low protein flour and I can't get past 65% if I don't want to get flat bread. Uh, Serpent Rider, please also try this dish starter and try adding a little bit of vital wheat gluten. I think it could be a game changer for you. <clears throat> Trip H, what if your fermentation, gluten talk by the way, what if your fermentation sample is at 50% but you're not done folding and developing gluten? um then you might be running into a serious issue if you ferment for longer then what's going to happen is your gluten network is going to just completely deterior deteriorate deteriorate <laughs> sorry for my german english uh and your gluten network is going to completely uh yeah completely turn into a catastrophe it depends on the flour that you have. If you have a strong bread flour, you could probably go to 100%. But if not, then I would probably do the unthinkable of just taking your dough and placing it inside of a loaf pan. You have screwed up and using a loaf pan is the best way to save your dough. Just take your dough, shape it, place it in an oil loaf pan, let it proof until the finger poke test passes and then bake it. That's what I would do in your situation. <laughs> Whiskey Tango Sierra, howdy from Texas. Hello. If you freeze with no overnight time, when then you don't get the flavor. Louisa, I have done a few experiments on this actually, and I have not noticed a difference in an overnight fermented fridge bread and a room temperature based bread. Some people are saying that this really creates you that tang, but nope you get the tang by having a longer fermentation. That's how you get the tang. Or by having a starter that focuses more on the bacterial part. So <clears throat> I have not noticed, at least myself, of course, I have not conducted thousands of experiments, but in my case, even for room temperature-based dough, it got a nice tang to it. So the overnight fridge part is mostly that you can control when you want to bake the bread. In many cases, you don't want to bake your bread right away. You might want to wait a little bit because it's already too late or so. Or if you're in a bakery, you want to control when you can bake the bread. And that's why people do it. It also helps to make the dough a little bit stiffer, so scoring is easier. But uh, from a flavor perspective, as far as I can tell now, it might change. I don't see that much of a difference. Louise I. Wow, so many great questions, Louise. With the stiff starter, will I have a better chance of getting an ear? Yep, you definitely will have a better chance of getting an ear. <clears throat> Matthew Gialorakis, nice to meet you. Have you done any tasting on the pH of the water when you make the dough with? 
<clears throat> I recently went all in and bought a good pH meter and discovered that my tap water was already at a pH of four. <laughs> oh my goodness, Matthew. And did you drink that tap water for years? I wonder what happened with you. That's a super sour tap water. Oh, <laughs> uh, wow. That's really interesting. Um, nope, I've not actually done that. There's actually another YouTuber, Vito Lacopelli. I hope I pronounced his name correctly. He recently made a video where he would bake pizzas with bottled water from New York and Los Angeles, and he would test the difference. Quite interesting video. <laughs> Summer Deep, thank you so much. Um, yeah, the pH reader, I think it's a great trick, but also very technical. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the people here are going crazy. Code, not sure what kind of sour water do you have? Caro, what the? I, I'm not uh, supposed to say bad words. What tap water do you have? <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's super, super funny. Yeah, here. It should be between 6.5 and 9, your tap water. But 4, that's, I don't know what, what happened there. Maybe something went wrong there. <laughs> <laughs> beauty with lila please do a sourdough bread recipe with seeds i actually have done one before i've done one i made my no knead bread and i just added a few seeds to it on top so please do check that out if you want to add seeds a good way is you shape your dough you just wet it a little bit the surface and then you add your seeds on top and then you place it like that in the Benetton. If you want to have seeds inside of the bread, then just start to add them right away uh, when you make the actual dough. Hope that helps. It's not so complicated, I would say. Felipe Sancho, hey, the description says to submit the pictures to submissions, but it's not under Dr. Doe. Is that the one? Uh, Jan, uh, yeah, Jan just shared a picture on the Discord server. The bread decoded, that's the name where you want to post everything. So the bread decoded and then the submissions channel. Um, Jan just shared a really, really beautiful picture there. Let me just also put this here on the screen. Look at this. Be prepared for an amazing bread. I hope you're ready. Already grab some butter, please. And it's uploading. Oh, check this out. Beautiful picture from Jan here with a gigantic piece of bread. Wow, that looks so fluffy. Look at that. And I think, Jan, you made it with a stiff starter, if I can tell correctly, right? That's what you wrote to me before. Wow, what a gigantic bread. <laughs> Irene Cheng. Hi, I'm from Singapore. My starter has a floral fruity smell, but it doesn't have a sour taste at all. Is there anything I can do to improve it? Yes, uh, try going more towards a liquid starter. That definitely helps to get more bacterial activity. Please do try that and let me know if that works. Greetings to Singapore. Steven Backwell. Hi from South Africa. I watch your videos and follow you on Instagram, but I just realized I don't even know your name. Oh my goodness, so my name is Hendrik, H-E-N-D-R-I-K, Hendrik, that's my name. And nice to meet you, thanks for following me. So, okay, great, so thank you everybody. If you, In case you want to dial in, please share it inside of uh, the bread decoder on our Discord server, and then the dial in credentials are also in there. And Gaudi Bogoya has dialed in, but your microphone is muted. So if you want to join, uh, unmute your microphone. I will be seeing that, and then I can add you to the stream as well. So just that in case you want, but you could also just stay in there in the waiting queue if you wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go back to the next point. And I just, I made this one video on, this topic before and the title was avoid this one stupid mistake when baking bread and i think this is something that has caused me so much pain and it's so easy to fix i was baking 
too hot. I was making, right, I need to talk about this guy in a little bit. So I was baking too hot. And what happened is my bread, it just simply wouldn't grow in the oven. I mastered the fermentation. The fermentation was perfect, but then my bread was in the oven and still I wouldn't get that oven spring. I wouldn't get that ear. My bread would just be a little bit flat. And that had something to do with how I baked my bread. And we will be talking about that a little bit in a second. First, I wanted to show you this great picture here of Mr. Uh, Maillard. He was a French guy and he discovered something. He discovered a so-called Maillard reaction. Now, this sounds like it might be something you don't want to have, something scary. But the Maillard reaction is what gives your food that typical distinctive brown color. So the Maillard reaction gives you that crust. Now, the problem with the Maillard reaction is that if it happens too fast, then your bread can't grow anymore inside of the oven. <clears throat> and this means you will not get that oven spring. So the Maillard reaction, you want to have that at the end of the baking process, but not at the start. At the start, you want your dough to grow. And then afterwards, you remove your steam from your oven. And then you want that Maillard reaction to take place. And depending on how long you bake then, the darker your bread becomes. This is a personal preference, what you prefer. Yes, uh, me eating a very yummy bread right here. That's what I like to do sometimes. Just put that whole big bread directly in my mouth. <laughs> yes, so there is a problem. And I talked about this before. This on the left-hand side was a dough that I made, uh, which I baked at a higher temperature. And on the right-hand side, I baked it at a lower temperature. It was exactly the same dough. The only thing was I changed the baking temperature on the left in comparison to the right. So temperature is very, very, very important when baking bread. And the fix is, so bake your bread at 230 degrees Celsius. So don't go too hot. I know that there are some recipes which are saying 260 degrees Celsius. That would be like, I think 480 Fahrenheit. Uh, but to me, going a little bit lower has really worked the best. It has helped me so much to get more uh, oven spring. And your home oven setup. And that's what I wanted to talk about. That's how I'm baking my bread at home in my home oven. I made myself a pizza stone, which perfectly fits my oven. It was around 20 US dollars, so not so expensive. I have another bowl below where I put in some boiling water. It helps a very steamy environment. But the real secret is actually this one tray which you have on top. And um, the basic one, basic home oven is, you just remove the stone, you remove the bowl of water, but you still have that tray. Buy yourself a cheap tray and just place it on top of your dough. And this is gonna help, you'll have indirect heat. This helps from having the Maillard reaction uh, delayed a little bit. Just by placing this one additional tray on top, you're simul simulating some sort of Dutch oven. That's gonna help you to make so much better bread because the Maillard reaction is delayed and you get more oven spring. Right, let me leave this picture here and let's go back to some question. And there's actually somebody dialed in here, Ron. Are you ready to be added to the live stream, Ron? Give me a thumbs up. Yes. Ron, hey, how are you? Hey, how you doing? Oh, wait, actually, one second. I need to just change my... Can you say one thing one more time, please? Hey, how you doing? Yes, nice. OK, perfect. Uh, I'm great. How are you? Where are you from, Ron? Uh, well, originally from Canada, but I live in uh, Louisiana now. Oh, that's awesome. And you like to bake bread. Yes. Uh, well, I'm, I'm a computer geek as well, and uh, but I like to uh, do photography and like to, to bake. So That's awesome. And, uh, nice. And what sort of bread do you like to bake? Uh, well, lately, uh, I've been doing a lot of sourdough. OK. And uh, and uh, and I, I uploaded, I posted a couple of pictures there of my uh, the way sourdough that I've been playing with. Mm -hmm. I'm and just... so, uh, so it's I, I I played around. I gotten some uh, some uh, you know some really good uh, milk, you know, uh, and uh, they had like the the cream line milk. Mm -hmm. And so then I. Uh, I made some mozzarella cheese with it, and I, rather than throwing out the whey, 
I figured, well, I'm going to try playing around with that and using that as the liquid in my sourdough. So. And everybody, I'm going to be showing the pictures from Ron in a little bit. And please grab yourself some olive oil or some butter because those breads are looking really delicious. So. Check this out, Ron. Wow. When are you opening up your own bakery? <laughs> that's, what everybody that's what everybody tells me, but my... Uh, <laughs> it's my IT career that allows me to uh, to do this for fun, right? Uh, <laughs> so that's the perks of home office, right? You can just make a nice dough while you're working. Exactly. Yes. So. <laughs> well, Ron, but, they but really you can look see there, I'm, I'm using the Challenger bread pan. Uh, you're right, and then uh, I add a couple ice cubes to it. Um, nice. You know, for that first twenty minutes to get the steam. And yeah, I think it's a, if you bake a lot, then this is a good investment. But it's, of course, also quite an expensive tool to have, right? It is. And, and then the, the flour that I'm using, I'm getting from a, uh, a local, well, not local, it's a mill in, out of uh, Austin, Texas. Okay. And uh, so I get double zero flour from them. And it's probably 14, 15% protein. Okay. So very quite high strong protein flour, flour mm -hmm. and stuff. But uh, because I just do it for fun and I buy five pounds at a time, it cost me like six dollars worth of flour to make a loaf. <laughs> wow. Okay. Okay. That's quite expensive. It is. So, you know, it's like people have asked me, it's like, well, can you make it and sell at the farmer's market? It's like, well, I don't think anybody's going to pay $20 a loaf at a farmer's market to make it worth my while. So. <laughs> <laughs> it could be a very special loaf then, maybe. Yep. <laughs> Did you have a particular question you would like to ask, Ron? Uh, well, so I know, I know you used to, you know, do the pH and that kind of stuff. And so I've got the parameter and have been doing, uh, you know, well, using it. And so I've been checking my starter, looking at around 4.2 is when I use the starter to make my sourdough bread. Mm -hmm. And then I let after, you know, during the bulk ferment, I usually keep it going until the flour or till the pH level is back down to about probably 4.6 before mm -hmm. I bake the bread. Mm -hmm. But uh, so I didn't know what your thoughts were on those pH levels. And mm -hmm. so I think, first of all, kudos for getting a pH meter. I think it really helps to have consistent results. Uh, one thing you need to know about the pH meter, though, is that your sourdough starter is different than mine. So I wouldn't be able to give you an exact pH value okay. um, because this depends on the composition of microorganisms you have inside of your sourdough starter. Um, what I can do tell you for me, for instance, I like to finish my bulk fermentation at around 4.2. And then when I bake my bread, my pH is at around 4-ish, 3.95-ish or so. That's when I typically okay. bake my bread. But this is something that uh, I like to use the sample that I showed before to monitor the progress. And then I just measure the pH of the sample. And so I know, okay, roughly this corresponds to this pH value, this size increase. Okay. So the 4.2 that you say, <clears throat> is that during, using just a room temperature, complete bulk ferment, no refrigeration at all? or uh, So th that's the bulk fermentation, and then I shape it, and then it goes down to 4-ish. Okay. So, okay. so you had about 4.6 is when I start shaping it, put it in the Bannetons, let it rest for about 30 minutes, and then I put it in the fridge for overnight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So by morning, it's probably down, you know, closer to the four, right? I, so I think based on what I can see, you would have more room to let it ferment longer. Okay. So you have a strong flour, you could let it ferment longer. And what this would mean is that, of course, the tang that you have inside of your dough, it's going to change. You'll have a stronger sour taste to it. That's something you could experiment with in case you like. I think your bread looks perfect. But in case you want to play with flavor a little bit, you definitely have room to ferment it for a longer period of time. Your bread would become more sour in case that's something you want. Of course, okay. it depends on what you like. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I just got some squid ink and I'm going to experiment with some squid ink sour. That's cool. That's really nice. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, Ron, thank you so much. All right, Great thanks. question. Keep me posted on your progress and thank you. Yeah. Greetings. Right, thanks. Take care.
So everybody, great question here from Ron. Totally appreciate it. And one more time, the bread Ron has been baking. Wow, that really looks fantastic. And just one more time summarizing, flavor is what's most important. And every bread that you're making at home is a win in terms of flavor. And by changing the starter, by fermenting longer, you can adjust the flavor that you have in your final bread. And I think that's really fascinating. Okay, just going back to the questions now, and then I'll be showing you, I'll be sharing you a few channel updates on what's upcoming on this channel. So if you have questions you would like to ask, either do it like Ron, thank you again, Ron, dial in, or you can write them here in the chat. I'm hoping uh, I read the um, Spodermann Glutentag, Guten Tag aus Norwegen, greetings to Norway. Dexpert, Hendrik, your picture showing a double ear reminded me I've been getting double ears almost invariably. What causes this? Do you know? Uh, yes, I think it's, first of all, the ear you get by, let me show you one more time in case you don't know what the ear is. Here, I'm taking Ron's picture here one more time. Here, the ear is the part here that just goes upwards. And this is a sign that you've done everything right with your wheat-based sourdough bread. And to get the double ear, this was uh, what the expert was talking about. This is one was one of the doughs that I made. Here you can see I have an ear on almost both sides. And I think here again, you need to have a very, very, very well fermented dough. So you need to nail the fermentation. And then it's the scoring angle. If you cut not so much at a 45 degree angle, maybe a little bit less than the chances are bigger that you are getting this double ear. At least that's how I can explain it. I hope that makes sense. Oops, comments. <laughs> Beauty with Lila. Can I freeze the sourdough in the freezer? Yes, you totally can. I made a video on this. This really, really, really nicely works. What I like to do though is I like to bake my bread until it's done, half time, so around 25 to 30 minutes. <clears throat> I check the temperature, I know that it's done. And then I didn't create the crust yet. So the Maya part is still missing. And what I do is I just take my dough then and then I freeze it. And then it stays very, very good in the freezer. And then for when I want to bake it, I just let it thaw. I think that's the right word, thaw, overnight in the fridge. And then I just bake it the next day non preheat oven, another 10 minutes, another 20 minutes until my crust has the nice color. And you have just made the perfect sourdough bread and you timed it even. Imagine your family comes over, your friends come over and you can serve them that great sourdough bread. People are gonna love you for that. Mayor, hi, what is the temperature to stop the wet phase and at what temperature do you finish the bread? To stop the wet phase, what's the wet phase? I'm not so sure what the wet phase is. I think that might be the first stage of the fermentation. Um, temperature. I think there is actually one really important point here and that is temperature. Temperature is the way, temperature is an accelerator of the process. The warmer it gets, the faster the whole process is. The, cold, the colder it gets, the slower the whole process is. I have not really noticed so much of a change in terms of taste of the actual dough with different temperatures. I've tested that, but it's just that things are happening way faster. So if it's very warm where you live, you might want to be using a little bit less sourdough starter just to slow down the whole process. If it's colder where you live, you can use a little bit more sourdough starter because everything is slower for you. That's actually why some people are having issues in winter because they rely on timings and suddenly everything just takes two times as long. Really, just the difference of a few degrees can already be such a big difference in the end. Hope that makes sense. Kaya Vot, hello all, nice sourdough community here. Yes, thank you. Thanks, uh, Gluten Talk to you as well. Great community indeed. Okay, so um, if you have more questions, just write them in the channel. I'm now going to be talking about a few of the channel updates. And of course I need to add myself here, screen share. 
Phew. Channel updates. First of all, um, there is going to be a winner of a random cool shirt like this, which is my merch. Um, all you have to do is, once the stream is done, drop another comment on which you think is the most important or the biggest mistake there is. Just drop a comment, and I'm going to be doing a raffle, and I'll be choosing someone from you and gift you one of those nice shirts. No matter where you live, just drop a comment later when the stream is over, and you might have a chance to win a shirt like this. This is what I call the happy sourdough bread. You can see it has a nice ear to it. It looks nice and lovely. Uh, my favorite style of bread. Oh, and yes, I wanted to talk about a few more videos that I'm currently making. I've announced before that I wanted to start uh, <clears throat> a bakery. And I'm still on it in Germany. It's a little bit hard with the regulation. And the idea for the bakery was I wanted to do a par-bake bakery. So rather than finishing baking, I wanted to do a delivery bakery where you can order the bread online and you would receive a par-baked loaf. So we have successfully baked the loaf without the crust development yet. And um, then you can just buy that bread and you place that in the oven and then you finish baking at home. And you would have a very, <clears throat> very, very fresh bread at home then and you could recreate the whole experience. I think this is a really cool idea because then also you wouldn't really have to rely on selling everything locally and so on. But then a few interesting things happened, like here, for instance. Um, I noticed how my sourdough flies, fruit flies, really started loving my sourdough. And um, then what I did is I just out of curiosity, because fruit flies are used for yeast to reproduce. So the yeast is creating some kind of um, aroma which attracts the fruit flies. And this way the yeast spores are able to reproduce because the fruit flies will have them on their body and then they will fly away somewhere and they will allow the yeast to just move some of its genetic material around pretty much. And so what I did is I made a bread, I let my sourdough stutter in, be infected by fruit flies and I made a bread out of it, but I couldn't really notice a taste difference. <clears throat> I have not made the shared the video yet. But then I made a sourdough stutter completely initially made from fruit flies. I know it sounds a little bit disgusting, um, but I think it's a really cool idea, which nobody had ever done. And uh, this is something that I'm currently experimenting a little bit, uh, just because I'm, I don't know, I'm, I just find really, really interesting to do it. So I'm going to be working on a video on this soon at some point, just because I, I geek out about this. And yes, I announced the par bakery. I said it before. And um, I'm going to be sharing a community post in a little bit on this channel. So if you're subscribed, you will see it. Just me making a post. And I will be baking two breads. And actually, they have already been made. And they're currently proofing inside of my fridge. And all you then have to do is you have to comment on this post. It's going to be there maybe tomorrow, maybe the day after. I don't know yet. And then <clears throat> you have a chance to win one of my breads, you will have the first par-baked bread and I will be sending it to you. Unfortunately, this only works for people in the EU. So not the US yet, because shipping would be too expensive. But in the EU, you can win my bread. The only thing that would be nice is if you could then maybe record a little bit of a video of how it tastes so that I can share that with the rest of the channel, because I'm very sure that people would be super interested in uh, seeing how my <laughs> bread actually tastes not from a subjective person like me, but maybe more from an, an objective person. So uh, yes, so you can win the t-shirt by commenting on this video. And then in a bit, we will be doing a contest on the par baked first bread and you can receive the first bread that I made for this bakery. <laughs> All right, and? Not yet, because there's one more guy here, Felipe, just dialed in, in the live stream. Uh, Felipe, if you are there, you can unmute your microphone, then I can also add you to the live stream. Uh, you don't have a camera, I'm just gonna add you as audio. Felipe, how are you? I'm, uh, I'm fine, and you? I'm great, thank you so much. Thanks for joining. No, no problem. Where are you so, from? Um, I'm Brazilian, but I'm currently living in Portugal. Ah, hold on. Yep. 
Okay, so I have a really, I think it's a stupid question, but I have no idea what's were happening here. Uh, last, last night, no, last, sorry, my English isn't very good. Very Yesterday, <laughs> I started a loaf and it was 80% hydration and I can't really buy bread flour here. So I used Vita Wheat Gluten mm -hmm. and I got about 14%. Mm -hmm. And I did yodelises. I usually don't do it. And I got an amazing window pane after I needed it. Mm -hmm. But this morning when I went to bake it, the dough was just really runny and loose. Mm -hmm. And it just didn't form a year and rose like really just a little bit. And For, it happens. Pancake. Yeah, it rose a bit more than flat, but it was really horrible. <laughs> And it usually happens when I do the autolysis, but I have no idea why. Uh, so the autolysis, it also starts to break down your flour. Two things are breaking down your flour. The autolysis, the fact that you have your flour in contact with water, that's gonna, because that starts the sprouting process. Well, your flour can't really sprout anymore because the seed is ground, but that starts sort of the sprouting process and that starts to break down your flour. So a non autolysis though, it's going to hold together better. At the same time, an auto least though softens the gluten network a little bit, so you might have more of an open crumb with an auto least dough. And then the second part that happens is the actual fermentation from your sourdough. That's also going to uh, attack or destroy your gluten network over time. So if your dough was good at the start and then became runny, it might have been the autolysis that your flour just have, has been in contact with water for too long, or it could be that you fermented for too long. Okay, then I should like try to not autolyse one to see what happens. Yes, I think that would be a good A-B test to just see what happens if you skip the autolysis. Um, it could be that, yeah, that simply your flour is not able to ferment for such a long period of time and it, it just starts to degrade then. Okay, uh, I've also got another question about yes, the stiff please. starter. Mm -hmm. uh, on your videos, you usually mention that you can substitute stiff starter for regular yeast. Yes. <clears throat> do you have any idea of like the amount that it should do? Because usually recipes call for like a teaspoon of yeast. Uh, I would, <clears throat> I would suggest to go for around ten percent of starter in general. Um, okay. I think that's a good value that you should aim for. Your fermentation time is going to be between seven to 12 hours, I guess, depending on how hot it is where you live. But still, you get the benefits that your flour is in contact with water. So you have a slow fermentation. And um, it's also, yeah, it's, it's slow, but it's also not too slow. I think it's a good combination of everything. Okay, that was it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Muito obrigado. Thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> talk soon. Talk soon. Bye. Thank you, Felipe. Bye. So great. Thank you so much, Felipe. Uh, thanks for dialing in. Let me just check through some of the questions here. <clears throat> it's a bit cold here in South Africa, and I don't have a proofing box. Should I lay on my dough like a chicken with her eggs? <laughs> yes. Um, please do that exactly like this and record a video and send me this video how you sit on your dough like a chicken with eggs. I would very much appreciate seeing this like a chicken warmed uh, dough. <laughs> uh, don't worry too much that it's cold in South Africa because the fermentation is gonna be slower, but it's gonna get there. Everything just takes a little bit more time. If you're <clears throat> busy, if you want things to be done faster, you could always just turn on the oven light instead of your oven. Just doing that is already going to get you a nice warm environment and place your dough like this inside of your oven. Just a neat little hack that you could use, Cody. Hope that makes sense. Kara, hi, Hendrik. Do you ever bake with spelt flour? Not so much yet. Um, people have asked this before, but I think it's very similar to wheat flour, but I'm testing a little bit currently also with some spelt flour. Summer Deep, I'm totally up for the part bake bakery. Thank you so much. Let's see how that's going to turn out. 
Panzo Ziolex, many greetings from Greek Ryan, Czech Republic, greetings to you. <laughs> and then uh, I was explaining the fruit fly sourdough stutter. People are saying I have flashbacks from the movie The Fly. Uh, maniac, yes, I'm a little bit of a maniac too. Carol, COVID-22 <laughs> incoming. <laughs> Let's better hope not. Maybe with bats, we can make a sardo from bats. Um, it would surely be in the news. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, I guess that brings us to the end of this uh, video. I'm going to be adding chapters again so that you have a chance to rewatch this, just putting you directly without all the questions to the respective chapters. Um, and yeah, I hope you learned something new. Thank you, everybody, for all the great questions that you had. It has been a lot of fun. And uh, let's see what's going to be happening next. I showed you a few things that I'm working on. I'm also right now working on one additional recipe where I'm comparing liquid stutter, stiff stutter, and a yeast, just to see how I bake the three different breads with the different stutters. I think it's also quite interesting. Video should be out hopefully soon at uh, some point as well. I see one more question from the expert. Hendrik, one last but very important question. My breads, when sliced, always dirty the knife. The bread is baked uh, at this sort of internal temperature. Just wait a little bit longer. Um, then this is not going to happen. But yes, it sometimes happens. And some bakers actually clean their knife after every slice. It's a disadvantage of making a bread which has high hydration, but then I think it's just this consistency of the crumb that's really so good. <laughs> wow, thank you so much, Thales. Truly appreciate it. Um, Adam Ragusia has a pizza bread video in which he argues if you use instant yeast, but let it proof in the fridge for a few days, a cheese flavor note similar to sourdough. What do you think? So this is, I think, a very important point. And I think this is so important. I actually do have an infographic here on this. And um, it's the process that starts when you mix flour and water. The starch become, starts to be converted to sugars, which can then be eaten by the yeast. The gluten starts to break down. So your dough is going to become better and better. So that's why a long fermented dough is typically more digestible than a quickly fermented dough. And I think that's the, it's the secret also to a Neapolitan pizza, for instance, a slow fermented dough with just a few really tiny, tiny uh, bits of yeast. Can it achieve the same taste similar to sourdough? Nope, it can't, because you're missing the lactic part, the lactic acid bacteria, the acetic acid bacteria. You only have the yeast part. So it's not going to be the same as sourdough. Is it going to taste very good? Yes, I think it does. Is it worth it to store your dough for a few days in the fridge? Nope, definitely not. Because in the fridge, everything is slowed down. You could achieve the same thing by just using a very tiny bit of yeast and then letting your dough sit at room temperature. Hope that answered your question. Thank you. Summer Deep, great session, Henrik. Learned a lot. You are welcome. Thank you so much. Laurie Rappel, why am I make sardo with yeast? Just use sardo. Um, still, I would say when you use commercial yeast, it's just one yeast strain. And for a stiffer sardo solder, you have cultivated wild yeast, different yeast strains. Russ Albino, thank you. You're amazing, Henrik. My pleasure. Okay, so it's been already one hour and 50 minutes. I hope you learned something new. I hope you had fun. It really has been a lot of pleasure. And uh, don't forget to press the comment once the stream is over uh, to win one of those cool shirts. And yeah, may the gluten be with you. You all have a nice weekend. Thank you so much. See you soon. Bye bye. I'm still here. <gasps> He's still here. Am I still here? Yes, I'm not finding the button. <laughs> okay, now I'm gonna go. See ya.